This free live webinar was recorded April 28, 2023, as part of the Canadian Neurovascular Health Society Education Series. This video is edited from the original raw footage. If you wish to support these live events and keep them free or at minimal cost for participants, you can do so by sharing this video, our website, our Facebook page, and or our Twitter site to anyone who may be interested. You may also make donations through Canada Helps or directly by e-transfer to Landon Schmidt, Secretary Treasurer at Landon at cnhs.ca. We greatly appreciate your support of our all-volunteer society. Donations of $20 and more will receive a Canadian Charitable Donation tax receipt. Join our email list to receive future event notifications by emailing Landon at Landon at cnhs.ca. Thank you. I just want to welcome everyone to this presentation by the Canadian Neurovascular Health Society and Dr. Marian Simka presenting to us from Poland today. Um, thank you for joining us. I see we have people from around the world. It's such an exciting time to be able to gather together in this way. Um, Dr. Simka is going to be talking to us today about abnormal cerebral blood flow uh, in the context of neurodegeneration. As I said, time permitting, we will take questions. There is a recording in progress and we will be releasing this recording through our email and uh, social media outlets at the end. Uh, so uh, that is something to look forward to. Uh, you can sit back, listen, take notes if you like, but you will have an opportunity to review the recording at uh, uh, when we release it in a few weeks. All right, I'm going to mute myself and turn my camera off and turn it over to you, Dr. Yearling, to introduce Dr. Simka. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Simka. So uh, Dr. Simka got his doctorate in medicine in 1988. And I went on to the Google Scholar site and saw that his first publication was in 1988 as he received his doctorate. And it was on um, early symptoms of gastric cancer. Since 1988, um, on Google Scholar, I have located 159 publications by Dr. Simka. And I think this is really amazing because he is, has a clinical practice and, and yet he is doing phenomenal amounts of research and publishing. So he must be a really busy person. Uh, his first paper on multiple sclerosis was published in 2008 and was in a journal, Medical Hypotheses, a journal that I've published in. And it was on the possible mechanisms whereby iron overload can facilitate the development of MS lesions. And he has, I think, if I remember correctly, about 52 or 53 papers on multiple sclerosis, and many of them deal with the cerebral venous outflow and problems um, with such outflow. And so, and this is his topic uh, today, so abnormal cerebral venous outflow in the context of neurodegeneration. So welcome, Dr. Simka, and the screen is yours. Thank you uh, so much for the kind uh, presentation. Uh, so, uh, probably most of, of, the, uh, of you uh, are interested in the link between multiple sclerosis and this vascular um, component. And if you, uh, if you are going back a little bit in the history of, of, of this issue, it was about 2010 when Paolo Zamboni from Italy discovered this abnormal venous in multiple sclerosis patients. Uh, there was a big question, uh, what is actually the, the main cause of this problem? Uh, it was, uh, was a, a, a big question which was not answered at, at the time because uh, very basic information was missing at the time. And I show you uh, in next few slides uh, which mechanism it is, was missing and what we know uh, now about 
about uh, cleaning of, of the brain and what perhaps uh, which what perhaps the, the role for venous system in this all of this new new degeneration um, pathologies uh, is and also I, I show you uh, some our uh, research on, on this topic which is of course is very uh, initial preliminary but you you have some opportunity to to see the uh, science from behind uh, with not yet, not yet published in the scientific papers and what what we are working uh, on one moment uh, how to try to to, to Oh, okay, now it works. Okay. Uh, so, it, it, this question nowadays is answered, but it's very recent history. It's about 10 years. Uh, so, um, in all, all tissues uh, throughout the body are uh, cleaned by uh, lymphatic system, uh, and lymphatic vessels uh, are found in particularly all uh, all organs maybe except for uh, eye and uh, if you look at the textbook of, of anatomy and so on you will find that, that there is no uh, lymphatics in the brain which was very uh, interesting because the brain is a very active organ and it should be cleaned by by, uh, by a, a system but this a cleaning system in terms of, of um, lymphatic vessels is missing, or we thought that it was is missing in the brain. Uh, so it was a big, uh, big question. And again, if you look at the textbook, you find that the, the role for this lymphatic system uh, in terms of brain is uh, is executed through cerebral spinal fluid, which if you go into the details in the physiology, it doesn't make sense at all. Uh, so it was a, a big problem. Uh, and uh, not so far ago, uh, there were some initial studies, for example, in the 18th of the last century, the researchers from the Maryland uh, postulated that there is an exchange between the interstitial fluid of the brain, parenchyma, and cerebrospinal fluid. Uh, so uh, it was initial thinking, but still the details were missing. And uh, this is the first study. You see this is 2012. So now we have uh, 10, 10 years of, uh, from this publication. As a researchers from the University of Rochester, uh, uh, they were looking at the flow of the cerebrospinal fluid and so on uh, using very special technique in a living mice under the microscope and so on. So it's a very advanced uh, research. Um, and this just uh, revealed that the cerebrospinal fluid enters the brain. Uh, along the small arteries, and then it flows out from the brain parenchyma uh, through uh, similar uh, channels uh, which surround uh, small veins. Uh, and uh, we already know for, for, for a very long time that there's this is the so big of broken space, which is the space between brain parenchyma and uh, small vessels and this big of urban space or uh, in other terms perivascular space is filled with cerebral spinal fluid and this fluid can travel along this this uh, the spaces inside the brain and here you see it uh, in the scheme uh, I'm not sure if you see my pointer. Is it visible? May I have a? Uh, yes, we do see yeah. the pointer. 
on the simple. Okay, so this is a scheme of the brain. You see, you see that this brown cells are neurons, which are supported by this uh, uh, light blue uh, cells, the glial cells. Here's a blood vessel, and this um, uh, light blue is the cells below sp spinal fluid, and this is the, the big of organ space, this perivascular space. So this uh, is that just found that this fluid from here enters brain parenchyma. And this is very nice picture with, with dark proteins in the, uh, the vascular space. So uh, in this way, we can see this, this blood vessels, which is cut longitudinally. Here you see a similar, but it's transversely uh, cut. So you see this perivascular space is very thin. And in this very nice picture, it's uh, visible that this uh, interstitial fluid flows out of the space to the brain parenchyma. This uh, black spots are neurons here, and you can and here you can see the uh, this whole uh, system. So this is a small artery. He has a small vein, and you see that the, there is flow of water from small artery through brain uh, parenchyma to uh, the space around the small uh, vein, and that this. Uh, bulk flow of fluid clears this this uh, cerebral tissue uh, because uh, the very important cells which are responsible for for this process and I show you later are uh, uh, so-called glial cells that are astrocytes. So the result just coined the term glymphatic system, which comes from two words: is uh, uh, this. Gli, gli from uh, go, goes from glial cells and the lymphatic, which is similar to lymphatic. So it's something like lymphatic, but but uh, different with, uh, structure. And you can see here another picture how how do you think it is working? So this blood vessel uh, here are astrocytes, these glial cells, which are very important in this, this process. And here you see uh, neurons. Uh, well, uh, it's very important that uh, uh, all these cerebral uh, small vessels are surrounded by um, end feet of astrocyte, these this, uh, glial cells. And these uh, end feet of astrocytes are equipped uh, with a very important. Uh, proteins, this is aquaporin-4. Uh, this protein is uh, actually is a, mm, a channel which can transport in and out uh, particles of water. So this is water channel because uh, another part of, of these astrocytes are uh, uh, not permeable and water can flow in and out only through this aquaporin-4 which can be, uh, in this agent can be uh, closed or open. So it is like a gate which can be closed and uh, or open uh, and uh, the water the particles can either uh, flow or can be stopped here. And here you can see uh, this in this scheme that there's, there's a flow. And now, again, from this very arterial uh, site through brain parenchyma to this very venous site. And with this water, all these waste products, this abnormal proteins and the other toxins are uh, cleaned from, from the brain. Uh, also, we know uh, from animal experiments that if this process is, is um, disturbed, uh, there is accumulation of pathological proteins, which we know that they are responsible for uh, diseases like Alzheimer's disease, for, for example. And in this picture, you see uh, that this uh, protein aquaporin 4 is really important in this process. On the left side, you can see normal uh, mice. Uh, 
the so-called white type. And here is a genetically modified animal which uh, lacks this, this protein. And uh, you can see that this activation of lymphatic system on the right side is not visible. And here you, you, you see uh, in this picture uh, the role for, for this lymphatic system uh, in protection of the brain against neurodegeneration. Here, here are neurons in this uh, violet uh, dots, or the, this, uh, the, this pathological proteins, for example, tau proteins. Or, uh, other pathological proteins, and they should be clear because these pathological um, proteins are normally produced by neurons, but they should not stay in the brain. Uh, and this, uh, uh, a year later, this uh, also very in, important finding. Um, is, uh, it was founded that the, the glymphatic system is um, active during sleep. And there is a big difference between uh, awake and sleeping brain in terms of, uh, uh, of the activation of the lymphatic system during sleep. This system is active uh, and in awake brain is uh, almost not working. Uh, so now we know uh, what's the role for sleep because during sleep, brain can uh, um, clean itself. And here you can see yeah, the brain in sleepy mouse, and this the brain uh, flares out. Here's a similar picture. And here you can see difference be between a sleep brain and a wake brain. It's, uh, very, very different. Uh, in another study, uh, beta amyloid is a protein which we think this uh, plays a role in pathology analysis of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and this uh, pathological protein is faster in mice uh, when my, uh, these animals were sleeping. Uh, so this is another proof for the role for, uh, for sleeping. So you can see we need sleep. It cleans up the brain. And uh, from this, uh, this research, which is now about 10 years old, uh, there are several implications for neurological disease. Uh, and uh, now we think that the glymphatic system uh, probably plays an important role in a number of neuro neurodegenerative diseases, including Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Huntington's disease, uh, and NLAS. Maybe also uh, another neurological disease, and uh, there's a, a common patho mechanism. There's accumulation of all these diseases, uh, misfolded prion like proteins in neurons. Uh, but uh, there are different proteins uh, in this different neurological disease. Uh, in Alzheimer's disease, there's a uh, tau protein and the beta amyloid, uh, and the, for example, in Parkinson's disease, is alpha synuclein. Uh, a few late, uh, years later, there was another very interesting finding. Uh, so, in the beginning, I told you that uh, in the textbook is written that there are no lymphatics in the brain, but actually they are, but they are not. Uh, throughout the brain, but uh, these lymphatic vessels surrounds big venous channel the, the drain the, the, the brain. Uh, in the cranial cavity, they are called venous sinuses because they are not normal veins because they don't have a wall, but they are made of uh, dura. And you can see this uh, lymphatic vessels surrounding. Uh, sinuses in uh, animals, but the same lymphatics were uh, a few years ago found also in, in humans. Uh, so it actually looks, looks like, like this here. You can see this venous sinus and uh, this lymphatic um, vessels that are close to this uh, big venous channels. Uh, 
Also, it was found at least in animals because in humans this uh, information is uh, still not not possible, uh, not available. That uh, in the young animals, young, young mice, this uh, cerebral lymphatics were better structured. There are uh, nice channels, uh, and the clearing potential was higher in comparison with aged uh, aged uh, animals. And you can see this uh, different this, uh, young lymphatics here and uh, quite pathological, I would say, uh, in old, uh, old mice. So uh, now we know that uh, this uh, clearing of the brain consists of two processes. First is the lymphatic system, which clears the parenchyma, this uh, cerebral tissue. And then uh, all this fluid with waste products comes to the lymphatics, uh, these uh, green ones here on this picture. And in this way, through the lymphatics, it, it goes out of cranial cavity to the out of the head to, to go into neck, uh, neck and toward the heart. So uh, it was uh, so we know uh, until now. Uh, a big question is that chronic cerebral spinal insufficiency uh, in terms of uh, what, what was uh, described by, by Zamboni and, uh, and other researchers on this field play uh, here a role. Um, because uh, all this uh, venous pathology, uh, pathologies uh, comprising chronic cerebral spinal venous insufficiency are located outside of cranial cavity, outside of head. They are located in the head. You can see, for example, the pathological jackal valve, the lower part of neck. Uh, here is a similar problem. Also, this internal jugular vein here with the stricture here and out of the um, uh, collaterals here on the neck. But this pathology has nothing to do. Uh, at least morphologically, uh, with this uh, venous and lymphatic uh, flow inside the brain. But uh, it's tempting to speculate that even there is a venous congestion, uh, congestion within several uh, microvasculature, uh, which probably uh, is present in the setting of kind uh, of spinal venous insufficiency because if, uh, just imagine that if this uh, big vein here, this blue one, is blocked, so this entire uh, process will be stopped probably. Uh, so, uh, so it's, uh, probably it may play a role, but of course. Uh, for the time being, uh, evidence for, for this is luck. But we have some indirect uh, observation. For example, uh, here is an, a nice uh, picture from the team of Markaki. Uh, and they found that uh, in the majority of patients presented with the Parkinson uh, disease, there's abnormal, uh, abnormal uh, pattern of uh, big cerebral veins. You, here you can see the right internal jugular vein uh, with uh, intracranial big veins, and you can see that this, this uh, picture is very asymmetric. This asymmetry is typically seen in humans, usually it is uh, venous blood vessels located on the right side are bigger, than the uh, left sided, but here the asymmetry is very big. And there are already some papers on uh, that speculated that perhaps uh, this abnormal extracranial venous problems may contribute to intracranial pathology. And you can see one of these papers. Uh, here's another by Zivadinov from Buffalo uh, University. Uh, but there are still a um, suggestions, hypotheses, and not, not, not uh, evidence. The other problem is that uh, uh, 
this uh, Venus uh, structure is located outside the cranium, outside the school, it can be differently located. And here you can see the, the magnetic resonance of a patient uh, with internal jugal vein. And you can see that uh, this vein is uh, structures in two locations. First, in, this, in the red arrow points, the structure on the upper part of this vein is just below the so-called jugular foramen. And here in this area, there are several bony structures, this uh, transverse process of the first uh, cervical vertebra, also this is a styloid process of the temporal bone, bone here, and in some individuals, this space here can be very narrow. And also there's another problem here, the level of uh, jugular valve. And which of these structures is really important? Maybe none of them, maybe both of them. Uh, uh, about 10 years ago, there were uh, many uh, uh, endovascular procedures performed in these this patients. So we have some, uh, some observation regarding the, the morphology of, of these uh, this veins. And for example, here you can see the, the patient presenting with internal jugal vein, which in the upper part is very, very thin here, but it's a rather uh, unusual uh, picture. Uh, here on the right side is uh, another problem because uh, there is no visible structure here, but uh, on the left side, there's a um, stagnation of outflow through, through this vein. Uh, and the question is which of these two structures are uh, more relevant? This is located in the upper part or this one located in the lower part of, of the vein. Uh, of course, uh, uh, any research in living humans would be very, very difficult and almost impossible. Uh, and in our team, and now I'll show you some uh, our our research, uh, not not the research of the other. We performed uh, investigation uh, with neural modeling of the blood flow in Messi. So uh, until recently, this modeling of blood flow was very expensive, expensive and difficult, but uh, all these uh, IT technologies are developing and now uh, uh, the software uh, is not so expensive. Uh, computers equipped with fast processors are also uh, quite, uh, quite cheap uh, and the programming is not, not so uh, difficult. And I show some uh, our research. So in this study, we perform simulation with this software. We build models, three-dimensional models of internal jugular vein, like here. It's a simplified model, like a tube, and you can see uh, the flow, which is normal. Then we modified this tube and we put some narrowing on the beginning of the uh, of this, this tube and, and the end. But you can see that the flow is almost the same, uh, not a problem. And then uh, we put uh, in the beginning and the end stitches and to look to what, what happens with the flow. And you can see if there is. Mm, normal tube, normal pain. The flow is 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 normal. There's a parabolic uh, profile of the velocity, and this we, we see the image subject, for example, in sonography, the same picture. Also, uh, if there is a small structure here, and and uh, at the end of of this of the vessel, the situation is almost the same. And this vein here, or this, this tube, resembles what we, what we see in the living humans because uh, normally there's not a, a regular tube, but it's a little bit wider in the middle part of the, ne of the neck. So it is like in the normal situation. Also, the flow is not, not disturbed. And here you see what happens if you put in the beginning uh, a stenosis, a stitch. This, uh, it will be the same situation. I go back uh, 
like here. You can see that this here and this vein is not normal situation, goes between styloid process of the temporal bone and first uh, cervical vertebra. It's so called eagle uh, syndrome in, uh, in radiology, we call this, this situation. It, it happens to some, some patients. And you, you see that uh, when this structure is here, the flow from this normal uh, goes awry. This, there are some vortices uh, and so on, and also the velocity goes down. Here is uh, the red color represents high velocity, the, the blue one is a very low velocity, and you see that, that the blood goes uh, slower and slower, and this F situation with the structure is very high here. Uh, it's, it's almost uh, this, this blood uh, this flow in this in this model because it's not not blood but was modeling of blood flow uh, almost completely stops. Also, we looked what what, uh, what happens regarding uh, symmetry and asymmetry, and the uh, most uh, pathological situation is like here when the stenosis is asymmetrically positioned, not uh, it's not located in the middle, but slightly uh, away from the center. And, and you can see here uh, that the, the flow is going here, there's back, back, uh, backward flow and so on. Uh, interestingly, if uh, it were a real patient and we put, for example, a catheter and put, put a dye here, we will not see this, this flow disturbances. Uh, so you can see here that the most severe flow disturbances were found in, at least in our modeling, in this model with nozzle-like structures which are located asymmetrically outside the main axis of the vessel. Uh, and uh, if we were looking at these uh, valves here, so they contributed a little bit to this, this abnormality of the flow, but not so much. So uh, at least in our models, this structure located in the upper part uh, of, uh, of this model of internal drug veins were more relevant. Mm, so perhaps this uh, endovascular procedure that were, that were performed in the past, at least in some patients, were mm, not perfectly located because uh, this most important problem was not addressed in this uh, in these patients. Another problem. Uh, we know that there, there, there are two alternative outflow routes from the brain. Uh, this is a, these are internal jugular veins, which represent the main outflow route from, from the brain. And there are also alternative outflow pathways. These are uh, vertebral veins, deep cervical veins. Uh, if an individual is uh, lying uh, down in the supine or prone po po position, a majority of blood uh, flows out from the brain to so this main pathway uh, comprising comprise of uh, internal jugular veins. But uh, if the head is elevated, well, when we are sitting, standing, and, and so on, uh, a vast majority outflows uh, through the vertebral veins and the other veins. Uh, so in the next step of our investigation, we um, build a similar model, but uh, comprising this internal jaguar vein here, and also this alternative outflow route uh, in this vertebral veins, um, deep cervical veins, uh, the total area is similar, but these veins are, are thin. And you can see here in, uh, in this model, which represents um, a person which is uh, in the supine position, that the a majority of flow goes in this way. Here, there's uh, only a slight uh, flow. Uh, when we built another model, uh, representing upright body position when this middle part of internal jugular vein collapses, you can see that 
uh, more uh, flow uh, goes through this alternative pathway. Yeah. So it shows us that our modeling is, and we see an intriguing subject, the, the, the same situation, that our modeling uh, it looks correct. And then we uh, put in these models these stitches. And you, you see here, for example, this is a model of a patient with pathological jugal vein. Valve here. So you can see that the it's almost the same situation. That this abnormal valve doesn't contribute much. Of course, there is a high flow velocity here, but the flow is not so disturbed here. Maybe there is some sort of stagnation, but not so much. When we put a stricture in the beginning of the vein here, the it looks that the flow is not so, so disturbed, but you, you see that more flow is going through alternative pathway, which indicates that the actual resistance of in this in the second model is much higher here. And if we put two structures in the upper part and the lower part, uh, the pathology here is even uh, higher and there's more outflow uh, through uh, through this alternative vertebral pathway. Uh, so uh, this modeling provides us some information what probably happens uh, in, in patients and maybe in the future this modeling can be useful. Uh, for example, will be a um, precise model of venous outflow in a particular patient uh, and we can uh, model what what will happen uh, before operation. Uh, we, for example, in a computer model, we we'll, uh, release this um, this picture and we we'll, uh, look what what happens with the flow. Uh, if the flow will be improved, so, so perhaps the operation will uh, will make sense, and otherwise, uh, with no indication for such a procedure. But of course. Uh, Perhaps it will be in the future. Uh, another question: A pathological jugal veins congenital or, or, or secondary? You can see here this uh, jugal vein valve uh, here uh, is um, obviously not normal because this very uh, thin channel here it should be much wider. Uh, and if you look uh, at, at papers and the uh, uh, two two point of views. Uh, some researchers think that these uh, abnormal ones should be called they are congenital, but um, the other thing is that perhaps they are secondary because we see uh, more these abnormal valves in older patients. Uh, and here is uh, our uh, another study we. Uh, with the use of different software, uh, we uh, built uh, models of, of the veins, and, but differently from the, uh, the the models which were shown. We uh, in this with this Compson Metaphysics physics um, software is possible to construct the valve which is flexible, and we look what happens with flexible valve if you put. Uh, in the beginning of the of the vein uh, a stitch. And you can see here what happens with the flow. Uh, there's a stitch which is located here symmetrically, but you see that um, below the structure the flow uh, becomes uh, asymmetric here. Also when there is not a normal uh, valve which usually consists of two uh, reflex, but there's um, something like septum. Uh, also, this uh, this flow is asymmetric. And here you you see, you can see what what happens with the flow uh, during this uh, this modeling. So you can see that there are vortices here. The, the flow is very asymmetric. And finally, 
you can see that this asymmetric bends this valve tense, which in this model was um, this values are really that's where um, elastic, uh, but not in the same way. Uh, so this valve leads a uh, bent but asymmetric. Uh, which uh, suggests that, that, that perhaps a stricture, for example, like in this, this, this patient uh, located in the upper part of intangible veins, uh, after many, many years, makes uh, this valve, uh, which initially was uh, symmetric, uh, maybe it makes it uh, distorted and pathological. It's, uh, at least with this modeling, perhaps it is possible. So the one pathology, because of this uh, flow uh, pattern, may lead to another pathology, which is even more uh, dangerous uh, in terms of flow and uh, and our flow. At least our modeling suggests that it, it may it can be here. Uh, next question, which uh, currently we want to address, is. What happens to extra cranial veins in the, in the lateral position? Because you know, there's, we, we know what, ha well, what happens to the veins uh, when a person is lying down on the back. We know what, what happens when he, is, uh, he or she is sitting or standing. But what happens in this position? And this is a very interesting study. Uh, it was published not, not so uh, far ago. Uh, and the researchers were looking at patients with presenting with Alzheimer and uh, other neurodegenerative disease. Uh, and they looked at, uh, because uh, during this research, um, in some centers, uh, they were taking uh, movies of patients sleep. And the researchers looked uh, in which particular position uh, did these patients sleep. Of course, uh, nobody is sleeping uh, during the whole night in the same position, but there are some, uh, some percentages of, of, of sleeping in particular positions. Uh, some um, people sleep on the back, some on the left side, or on the right side, and, and so on. And they found that uh, these people who are, uh, sleep a majority of time during light and the latter position were somewhat protected, uh, protected from new, new uh, generation. On the contrary, uh, people sleeping on uh, the back uh, were more prone to new generation. Uh, of course, there was this uh, observation was, uh, in terms of statistics, uh, it was significant, but the researchers found no explanation for this phenomenon. And uh, after this publication uh, in our center, we looked at that, that perhaps maybe the veins are responsible, but uh, how uh, does this um, veins draining the brain behave in a lateral position? Nobody has looked at it because you know, you, you, you don't examine uh, patient in this, this position. Uh, yeah, this finder from this, this study. But uh, it was uh, known from this uh, research on glymphatic system, uh, and I show you here, that this, that this glymphatic system is better functioning in the lateral position. They just uh, put these uh, animals, as I remember, they were rats. Uh, on, the, on the back, on the supine position, on the lateral position, you can see the lateral position is the best. But why? So maybe veins are involved in this phenomenon because, you know, if, if the veins is blocked here, there will be a problem with, with the clean, clean the brain. Uh, when the uh, vein is open, so perhaps this, uh, this process is um, better executed. So, uh, we know that uh, in the supine position, that the blood uh, flows out from the brain to the, the vein, so the, the vein, in the uh, 
upright position, uh, this kind of vertebral root is um, dominating. And what happens in the lateral position? And here he, in this picture is our uh, initial findings. And you can see uh, on the low, this lower slides, it's in the supine position. So this internal jugal vein is wide open. Of course, it's not like a tube, but it's uh, some, uh, somewhat collapsed here, flattened, but it's a big vein. Uh, here in the upright position is not so big. And you can see what happens in the lateral position. So in the right uh, lateral position, the vein is open here. In the left, it's even smaller than in the upright position. And you can see here another, uh, another individual who is in supine position, so this vein is wide. Uh, here is in upright position, it's collapsed. And the left lateral is wide here, and here is, is collapsed. So uh, in the lateral uh, position, one of the internal jugal vein is very wide. And the, the on the opposite side is uh, almost totally closed because it's all about gravitation. And the next question was, uh, what about total uh, outflow uh, through, the, through the veins? So we planned uh, another study, but unfortunately there was COVID. So our research was stopped for more than two years. Uh, but finally, the pandemic is almost, uh, maybe not 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 uh, finished, but but at least we can uh, I able to perform research. Uh, it's another another patients here. Okay, so there are findings in uh, 25 healthy subjects here, and you can see uh, there is a big difference uh, between uh, total flow in the internal jugal veins uh, in supine body position, this green one, uh, versus upright position. And we know this, but you can see that in the latter uh, position the flow is even higher. So most likely this lateral body position is perfect, is optimal and uh, the um, flow resistance is uh, the lowest in this body position. That's why probably uh, the outflow from the brain is, is, is optimal and that's why maybe of course, because it should be proven in its next experiments, uh, uh, the, the lymphatic system is working better and, and people sleeping on the uh, left or right side uh, are somewhat protected, protected for, for example, for, from Alzheimer, uh, maybe. Uh, also, the uh, next question will, will be which, which side is better, right or left? Uh, probably it depends on, uh, on uh, whether this means asymmetric or asymmetric and, and so on. Well, but these are our, our initial findings. Uh, our next step will be to look what happens with these veins in a patient who already have uh, some neurodegenerative processes. But, uh, and uh, we probably will start uh, these investigations in the uh, next Future. So, of course, there are much more questions than the answers that you can see what, what happens, uh, at least in our center. Well, thank you, Dr. Simka, for an excellent presentation. I was particularly interested in sleeping position and, and um, venous flow. Uh, we do have a number of questions in the chat. Um, one question is in the model, what was the distance um, valve to upper stenosis? And then flow rate question mark, pulse fertility rate question mark. Uh, so we put the, the, all these numbers, which uh, we already know from the uh, New York human. So there's, a, uh, of course, is in model in computer, but representing uh, blood as a fluid on this temperature, pressure, and so on, on the, the tube, the length. 
you know, of this tube uh, diameter and so on. It was like like the, the human vein. And it would be approximately what distance between the um, valve to the upper stenosis? So, you know, normally there's about 15, 20 centimeters long the vein. Yeah, yeah. Um, Follow-up question to that is, in model, uh, how long was any reverse flow relative to the pulsatility rate? Uh, it, it, it is not pulsatility because it's vain. Yeah. So, um, uh, I, I think that maybe... which is, is leaving the brain is, of course, is slightly pulsating, but is. Uh, all is almost almost constant blood velocity here, and yeah. at least in this, this blood vessel. Yeah, I, I wonder if, if the questioner meant um, a turbulence. So, I don't know. And from a second um, listener to clarify, sleeping on the left side promotes the most flow through jugular veins. Uh, yes, the, the small uh, the group was was not so big. So perhaps yeah. this difference between between the uh, right and the left side, the, the, you know, the circumference of a small group. And yeah. uh, what we know uh, is uh, that if you look at big cohort of, of people, because what was yeah. studied uh, very, long, very long ago. Uh, yeah. the most popular um, body position is on the right side mm. in humans. Yeah. So, so perhaps our finding that the left was in this group was, was better. Perhaps if you, you will examine more, more individuals in this difference with this, this area. Uh, I'm not sure it was not put in the statistic whether it was significant or not. Yeah. Anyway, you can see there is a trend of, of a better, better flow here. Of course, you should remember that if you look at the flow in, in the internal jugal vein, it doesn't mean that there is the only flow, because right. we, the rest of blood flows through different veins. Yeah. But yeah. the internal jugal vein is the widest, with the lowest um, uh, flow resistance. So if there's a big flow through this vein, which means that the total resistance here is low. If yeah. there's high resistance here, the, 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 the blood looks for uh, alternative pathways, uh, which indicates that the, the resistance in this, in the entire system is, is much higher. Yeah. Which probably is not a good situ situation. Yeah. And, and your study was small, 25 subjects, as I remember. Yes, yes, but because uh, you should start from, uh, from something. It's quite, tight, uh, you know, to, to examine one, one uh, person in all this uh, body position on the left side, on the right side, and so on, to measure and so on, it's about one hour. Yeah, it's a lot of work. So, you know, for small group, <laughs> it's yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> and after two two persons, they are, they are totally exhausted. Yeah, yeah, I can I can see that. And also in this, you know, this this computer modeling, it looks like that they are built in this model. Then you um, start your computer, and the results are after after one or two days. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so Another it looks very nicely in the picture, but it takes a lot a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, with uh, a computer, it would be quicker, but but you know, yeah. supercomputers are very expensive. But it, but as I said in the introduction, I'm amazed. You have 159 publications, and you've got an active clinical practice. You know, you must be working 18 hours a day or so. Uh, here we have another uh, question: Does exercise improve flow from the brain? Uh, and then meditation? Question mark. Head movements? Question mark. Maybe, maybe uh, at least we know that the, the, no, uh, when we are active, uh, so it is protects you from uh, neurological disease. Yeah. It's a good, very nice epidemiological studies. 
Yeah. Uh, but what is exactly the mechanism? Probably is uh, multifactorial. Yeah. But probably yes. Uh, at least activity is good. Good is good for, for your heart, for your blood vessel, for your brain, and so on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, another question: uh, Does the presence of a dural patch from a duroplasty in posterior fossa craniectomy impact? lymphatic drainage? I don't know. <laughs> okay, yeah. But probably no, because I know the lymphatic system, it, it works in the um, micro scale. Yeah. So, it's, but who knows? It's a very, very new topic. Yeah. Another question, have you seen positive results, uh, CCSVI with Parkinson's? And then it continues, um, I had tremendous results with MS and I'm now concerned, oh, it keeps, and now concerned and curious about it for my husband with a Parkinson's disease diagnosis. So I, I cannot answer this question, simply I, I don't know. Uh, these endovascular procedures and in some patients was open surgical procedure, they were performed about 10 years ago. Uh, then it was found that, uh, of course, there were some improvements, uh, but in a minority of patients, and these procedures are no longer performed. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, for, yeah. For 10 years. Uh, maybe yes, maybe no. Who knows? Probably in next future, this procedure will be not not performed until the basic research will be uh, yeah. completed. Maybe we'll yeah. go uh, go back to do this do this history, but uh, I don't suspect it will be very soon. Yeah, unfortunately, yeah. I always found it a shame that the neurologist didn't um, become interested. Why did a certain proportion of MS patients that had the CCSVI procedure done improved so markedly and for a long period. You know, it's too bad they didn't do research on why that small population improved and others didn't. Anyway, so we have another question. Um, question, since lymphatic flow is most active during sleep, would patients with sleep problems be at greatest risk? I guess greatest risk of uh, neurodegenerative. Yes, yes, and, and it is not from research. The, 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 no, the sleep disturbances is, uh, is associated with with the number of neurodegenerative um, problems. Yeah. Another one uh, from Rochelle. Um, that was Lucinda earlier. Uh, Rochelle. So, is it safe to say if there's Vascular stenosis, it should be addressed. That is surgery stent question mark. Hmm. Not, not at the moment. Okay. Not, not. And then Trev, by reverse flow, I was referring to the reversal inherent in a flow vortex. That is, did vortices exist for an entire pulsatile cycle? So I guess a cardiac cycle. Was this consistent with the Zamboni's criteria of reverse flow for greater than one cardiac cycle? Uh, okay, so so uh, actually, uh, this this Zamboni criteria they are they are quite old now, uh, and what probably what uh, what was included in this criteria was this uh, abnormal flow uh, because. Um, if you look at the details of performing this examination, uh, in this Zamboni criteria was, was regarded as a reflux. Reflux was a situation when we when you put so-called Doppler gate uh, during sonographic examination, and you will see uh, the reverse flow. But uh, if there is not that the flow is not laminar. But uh, in the same at the same level, it's going up and down. You will see something which you can call a flux, but actually it is not a flux. It's a it's a vortex. 
Mm. Uh, but in the sonography, it will look the, the same. And we see this this vortices in our uh, modeling. So, so probably this the situation. Uh, for example, sometimes uh, you see such, such vortices in the river when there is a uh, narrowing on the in the river. That's probably the same situation, which is the basic physics of of a fluid flow. But of course, it is making uh, resistance and uh, disturbance of, of flow, and this is not not a good situation. Yeah. Um, another question: Is there a thought that REM sleep disorder may be symptomatic of poor clearance of the glymphatic system? Maybe, but I don't know. The topic is too new. <laughs> so, do we have any other questions? I do have one. Um, if I remember correctly, um, in the internal jugular, a lower structure had more influence on flow than an upper structure. No, mm -hmm. no, no. It's a rare situation. The upper, upper. In, the beginning, in the beginning, at least uh, in our modeling. And it, it will explain, you know, this is a very nice study coming from. Professor Haki team, yeah. and they looked uh, at the flow, but uh, um, uh, they were using magnetic resonance imaging, and they were looking uh, at asso association, the link between abnormal flow in internal jugal vein uh, stenosis uh, and multiple sclerosis, and they found that. Uh, the most relevant uh, link was between uh, such a situation when the, in, in the multiple sclerosis patient, the, the, the stenosis, the stricture was located in the upper part of neck. And it will explain uh, our modeling. That this. Uh, interestingly, if you go with catheter inside this this blood vessel, inside the, the veins, you will not see uh, uh, any any flow disturbance, disturbances because we put the, the tip of this catheter at the level or below the stenosis, and the flow disturbances will be not seen. You should put this catheter inside the cranium to see the problem. Normally, it's not done because it's too dangerous. But with magnetic resonance, we see this flow, which is uh, in all these blood vessels. A few more questions. Um, in what position would a tortuous azygous most impact blood flow? Hmm. <laughs> I was, I, I'm very skeptic about the really meaning of azygous vein in this, this pathology, because this vein is draining only the lower part of spinal cord. And the multiple sclerosis patient, the lesions are rarely seen in this part of the central nervous system. I, I know that, 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 that in this uh, Zamboni study that they uh, found the, the problem in these veins, but yeah, whether they, it was actually relevant or not, I'm very skeptic about it. At least anatomically, it doesn't make uh, big sense. Dr. Simka, I have a question while Bernie's just catching mm -hmm. up on the chat there. Yeah. Um, in your 3D modeling that you showed the flow, um, you know, the flow with upper strictures versus lower flick strictures, and you looked at velocity in that parabola. Was there a fixed width to the dia to the diameter of that vessel, or did the modeling allow for? Um, yes, 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 yes. So you, you can change, and, and actually, I, I show only one, but, but you can see the small structure, big structure, uh, around uh, elliptic, and so on. So the. But what but about the vessel? This is very time consuming because you know you build a picture, this modeling, and you should wait for two days <laughs> for results and so on. And, and what about the vessel width between the strictures? Uh, you know, can the yeah, also you can model it. Oh, you can model. Okay. For simplicity, uh, is a tube, you, you know, but yeah. it's possible to make it uh, more uh, asymmetric. 
Uh, it's also possible, of course, uh, it uh, makes this, this modeling even longer. <laughs> Yes, it does. And ask the reverse here. Can sleep disturbances be caused by poor flow? So not the other way around. Like, so could the flow cause the sleep disturbance? Mm. Again, I can answer this, this question. I think it's, uh, everything is possible. Uh, okay. The big question is, uh, uh, why during sleep is uh, this, this uh, glycatic system is, is active? Uh, and the reason um, hypothesis is, uh, uh, goes in, in such a way that uh, the switching on of the system requires stopping the blood, uh, go, blood flow uh, in majority of brain. So you cannot be awake to the uh, when the, the, the blood is not going to the brain. Mm. You know, of course, I, not in big, big arteries, but in small arteries. Uh, so probably there's the main um, function of, of sleep that you, you are not active. So when the blood flow can uh, stop. Uh, when it stops, uh, the cerebrospinal fluid can uh, go in cranial cavity, but of course the vein, venous blood flow should go out. All this uh, fluid should be in balance. This arterial flow, uh, venous outflow, and several spinal uh, fluid. Uh, probably it's a very, very balanced system and uh, any disturbances of this, this, uh, this interplay between different different fluid here is, is dangerous and is making problem. But of course, the topic is very new. But but it was found. I, I think it's again the Professor uh, Haki team. They they were looking into uh, at the flow of cerebral spinal fluid at the level of um, cerebral aqueduct. Uh, cerebral aqueduct is a, is a small channel between. It's, just called, it's called fourth and third vent, uh, cerebral ventricle. And here, the, uh, the cerebral uh, spinal fluid usually is uh, going uh, in and out, in and out. And in, uh, in this, this, uh, this movement was disturbed in the patient with uh, Alzheimer's disease patients here. So probably it's a problem here. It's very complex and very new. So. I'll, yeah, I'll read the last two uh, comments. So from Marty Cleveland Innes, thank you, Dr. Simka. You diagnosed me with blood flow turbulence in 2009, committed to all lifestyle choices that improve circulation, still working, still walking. And from... Um, Oh, several more. Dr. Simka, we are very, from Bev to everyone. We are very grateful that you are still caring for all of us dealing with MS. Thank you. From Jane Longley. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Uh, thank you. Very interesting. I have CCSVI. I had venoplasty once in 2013 with significant improvement in walking for one month and ongoing improvement in a few other symptoms. No opportunity for further treatment. I shall favor sleeping on the left. Thank you again for your work. Thanks. <laughs> so thank you, Dr. Simka, uh, for taking time out of your busy schedule to give this presentation. It's very much appreciated. And I hand this over to Sandra. Yes, and I'll just echo that, Dr. Simka. We, I met you. You scanned me. You were the first person to scan me and and uh, diagnose my abnormal jugular flow, and that launched me on my journey to health improvement. So I'll add my voice to those others that are weighing in here. And uh, then we met you again, of course, at our Sherbrooke conference when you um, shared your research in 2013, I believe. So thank you. And to everyone on the chat, uh, again, look for the video to come out. And Dr. Simka, thank you so much uh, for staying thank up you, and you. giving us your evening, because I know it's evening there in Poland. And we do appreciate your, your time today. All right. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank, thanks for the kind invitation. All right. Thank yeah, you very much, Dr. Simka. <laughs>
We'll see All right. you. See you. Okay, bye-bye. So everyone, bye. um, look for the recording to come out. Bye-bye. I put um, I put the link if you choose to donate to our, our cause in the chat. You can look for it there. Of course, you can find us at cnhs.ca um, at any time. All right, everyone. Bye for now. All right. Bye-bye.